every single person out there, if you had to think for a little while, would figure out your top 10 favorite books of all time. And today, I wanna to start looking at one of my favorites. Today, I wanna to talk about one of my top 10 favorite fantasy and sci-fi books of all time, and that is Scott Lynch's The Lies of Locke Lamora, the first book of the Gentleman Bastard series. Um, it is a con artist, uh, burglary, spy-ish, thriller type book that is set in a very dark, very visceral world that you follow the villains. There are no heroes in this story, but there are friends. There are brothers. There are definitely villains that you root against as the book progresses. And uh, for such an epic book, I think this paperback could have had a little slightly better cover. Um, that's in a much later video. Um, there are some amazing versions of this book. Uh, that I want to get eventually. Um, many of them are from England, which uh, has some amazing book covers over there. But Lies of Locke Lamore is one of my favorite books and it's in my top 10 favorite fantasy and sci-fi books of all time. And today I want to talk about a few ways, mostly spoiler free with a few spoilers, spoilers thrown in about why this is in my top 10 favorite of all time. No ranking just yet, but it's definitely well up in there in my favorite fantasy sci-fi books of all time. The first reason I really feel like The Lies of Locke Lamora is an amazing book is for me, the writing style. It has an older feel to it, almost kind of like a Patrick O'Brien, maybe even going back to Alexander Dumas and to Charles Dickens. It has a older feel at times, just in the depth in which Scott Lynch goes in writing his world and his characters and the prose, that's another one later. Um, but the writing structure itself, I think in his style, um, while there is a lot of language, a lot of language. Uh, it is an amazing book that I feel just pulls you in and every single character has their own individual voice, which is an amazing thing. If everyone's read books where all the characters sound the same, and if you pulled dialogue without names, it, you would be really pressed to figure out which character was saying what. But in Lies of Locke Lamora, you can very easily tell whether it is Locke Lamora, whether it's Jean Tannen, whether it is uh, the Falconer. There are certain characters, uh, especially uh, eyes, um, there are certain characters that you can just tell who they are based off the language and the tone and the expressions that are being used. And that is an amazing thing. Secondly, as I mentioned, the prose in this is amazing. The character of voices, the dialogue, the discussions, the development of these characters throughout the book, uh, whether it's in the flashback sequences or in the main plot course, uh, you, through the prose, are able to just experience and see this world through the eyes of the various characters, mostly through Locke Lamora, but especially through other characters that you flash to, uh, whether it's part of the nobility or parts of the underworld. Uh, this is a amazing book that the prose draws you in and you very clearly understand. You can read it out loud and very well understand and feel the prose. Sometimes you read books out loud and it feels very clunky. It feels very... Uh, very nonsensical in nature, but the Lies of Locke Lamora, I feel the prose is, while it is a little older in its styling, uh, maybe a call back to some of the older styles of books, uh, the, the world building and the writing structure of it just puts the prose right in there and makes it fit and paint a very detailed picture. It's not for everybody, but for me, it is amazing. Thirdly, and this is a very important reason, is the world building that Scott Lynch does of the city of Camor, the different districts, the tone, the field, the world that is there. Whether you're in Shades Hill, which is a catacomb underneath a barrow and a, a cemetery where these orphans are being uh, are being taught by a thief maker to, how to, to, whether it's to thieve or pick locks or whatever it is, you're following that element of the underworld and then those, those orphans get put into different gangs throughout the city. You start experiencing the wooden waste, whether you're in the wooden waste, whether you're in the, uh, the alleys, whether you're in the shifting market, which is where you have this almost gladiator style fight between uh, a version of shark and these gladiators who fight them. It's an amazing world that you get set into and you experience so much the underlying seedy portion of the world. You see the visceral, very ugly side of the world and you also see the beautiful light side with the alchemical discoveries with 
oranges that have alcohol infused into them and grow that way where you bite into it and you can eat an orange, but it has a vodka rum flavor infused into it. And that just sounds amazing to try. And this world just builds such amazing picture and it's a major reason why this is a very very beautifully written and very thought out book and the later books as well republic of thieves not as much but red seas under red skies uh expands upon that world immensely and whether we get book four in the series or not uh this book sets off this series the gentleman bastard series in an amazing trajectory and the world building is a major part for that major reason for that Getting to the plot, we follow Locke Lamora and his gang. Uh, they're called the Gentleman Bastards. That's why the series is called that. And it has an Ocean's Eleven style feel to it where you have these, these, uh, these griffs that are being done. You have these scenarios that are being set up with these cons and you're seeing the successful play out. But as you follow the plot, what's amazing, and I really appreciate some reviews online don't like this, but I think it's amazing, is you follow along as you have a chapter in the present. You jump before that to a chapter in the past that has a very clear theme that ties into the present. So you keep going back and, and to present and then, then backwards and then to the present. And it may feel jarring, but to me, it reveals a lot about the characters that relates into the plot of the present, especially with uh, with Locke, with his friend Jean Tannen, with the Sansa brothers, with Bug. Uh, you have these characters that you are getting to know from their childhood, with their childhood foibles, as they're learning to find brotherhood, as they're learning to find trust in each other. And then you jump into the present where they rely upon that trust and you see them at the top of their con game. And it's an amazing book to read. And then the plot shifts like that. And it is a blood fest. It turns into a story of revenge. So it is Ocean's Eleven, which meets Count of Monte Cristo level styles of revenge seeking. And it is an amazing plot. And can't get into too many spoilers, but the, the cons that are done will grab you and are very creative and inventive. And the plot twists, the... Uh, the elements that come into that and the final sacrifices that are made and the themes that are seen throughout the book that paint a picture that culminate in the end in a beautiful payoff of a story. It is gut-wrenching, but at the same time, it is a story that will just grab you and hold you and the plot just drives this book that already has amazing world building and, uh, and prose and writing style and all that, but the plot just drives it forward. Fifth, and this is a little more limited, is the magic system within this world. This is a fantasy world that is much more in the underbelly, much more in the, the world of the gutter. The, you have the political aspect, you have the criminal aspect, and the interplay between those two. And what I love then is that there is elements of magic dropped throughout the world itself, the city of Kamor itself, you can tell was made by magic, elements of it, but you don't really know what that magic was. And then you see the Falconer, who is a member of this magical brotherhood, and you don't mess with them. If you if you harm or kill, if you kill one of them, uh, you, it's a death sentence. And so there's this, this conflict that arises between Locke and his group as they try to maintain their secrecy because they have been uh, they have been doing cons against the wealthy, which is going against the agreement between the nobles and the, the lord of the thieves, uh, Kappa Barsavi, which a lot of the themes of this are very Sicilian and Italian in nature. A lot of the words that come in come from Italian and Sicilian history. And the magic, when it does come in, is very small, but it's very impactful. And there's... it's. It's not a soft magic system, but you don't really clearly understand the magic, so it's not necessarily a hard magic system with rules that you know for sure, but you can tell that there is a structure to it and where it comes in, where that magic is used, and trust me, it is used for very detailed purposes. It leaves the reader at one point odd and another point where you're just shaking your head at the plot twist that happens due to the use of the magic system. And it's gut-wrenching, but at the same time is absolutely incredible. 
I mentioned before that brotherhood is an amazing aspect of this story. And there are a few stories out there that get brotherhood and the development of that close friendship between not blood brothers, but for all intents and purposes, closer than family uh, relationships. And the Lies of Locke Lamora show that. And let's just say Locke and Jean are two friends that you can go up against any two characters in fantasy, sci-fi, fiction, period, and I feel like their relationship will stand up there among any of them because of the strength of their relationship, and it all stems from the flashbacks, these boys who hate each other initially because Jean Tannen is good at things that Locke's not, but then vice versa, and they have this conflict, but then as you go forward with their story tied in with the current story, the, the con and grift that they're doing, and then later the story of revenge comes about, the brotherhood that you feel amongst this gang and then when a twist happens and there is bloodshed you feel that brotherhood the sense of loss and especially Locke who is a not a large dynamic muscular military leader but he is so good at what he does in terms of conning people that he gets too too big for his mask let's say and he makes some mistakes and there's things that happen that he feels a sense of responsibility for. And in the end, he makes the ultimate thieves sacrifice to the gods. They follow this one thieves god who is considered heretical, uh, but they're all, they follow, follow him. And Locke is supposed to be a priest of this, this unknown god. And he makes a sacrifice in the end that is very beautiful in a sense of trying to atone for what he views as his personal failings. And it's a, it's a beautiful symbol of loss of brotherhood and the, the, the quest to try to find a, a, a bit of atoning for that loss in a way. And so the brotherhood is huge here. And as I mentioned, lastly, one of the reasons that I believe that Liza Locke Lamora goes above and beyond other books of the genre is the story of revenge. Because not only do you have halfway through, you get this feeling of revenge from Locke and Jean as they go about to find revenge for the loss of some of their friends, I will say. And as the story progresses, as you have flashbacks to where the gang was when they started out as young boys and as they expand their skills and as they enter into the world of this criminal underbelly of Kamor with Kappa Barsavi and you see how much control he has and you hear about why the city is where it is with the criminal underbelly and the nobles having this agreement with the underbelly of the city where if you don't rob against the nobility, if you don't act against them, then they're not going to act against you. And then as you see that, you start to see where there is uh, in the present day, there is fear, and eventually the revenge for sins of the past come back to Kappa Barsavi and his family, and it impacts Locke, it impacts every single person in the city, but especially Locke and Jean. And the revenge that they seek against somebody who is themselves seeking revenge, it's a major marker of the plot and of the story and of the theme and feel of this book, which is just a masterpiece. And I hope some of these little things I've sprinkled through here, no major spoilers, but I hope that something from this book uh, sparked an interest in you and you'd have to read The Lies of Locke Lamora, the first book of the Gentleman Bastard series. I will go ahead and grade this book a A plus for sure. As a teacher, I got a grade, letter grades, um, <laughs> shifting to that versus the number and star system. So this is an A plus across the boards for me. It's not that it doesn't have its weaknesses, but it is so good at what it does that those few little things that maybe are a little clunky, you can skip past given the epic nature and also kind of the style of this book. It's very much personal uh, preference. I know some people mark this lower, but for me, this is a strong A plus, five out of five, however you want to look at it. And I absolutely love, love, love this book. It is an absolutely incredible read. I hope you've read it. If you haven't read it, maybe you can comment in uh, in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Whether you agree or disagree with me, that's fine. But this will be one of my top 10 favorite books of all time, barring some amazing future books that come out. 
And in the future, I will do a video where I actually officially rank where this is in my top 10. For, but for now, this is a book that is just in my top 10. And so thank you so much for watching up to this point. Um, if you like some of the things I've been talking about, uh, I have a few different videos here that YouTube is recommending. Check them out. Uh, especially this one right here where I talk about my, my favorite book covers that I own. Uh, I wish this one better, but you know, these ones are pretty good right here. So thank you so much, God. Have a wonderful evening. Talk to you later.